Good morning, everyone who loves to spend their Saturday mornings learning obscure science topics with me. I'm Dr. Meredith Warner of Warner Orthopedics and Wellness in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm a practicing orthopedic surgeon, but also have a deep love of all things wellness and health related, preventative medicine, natural medicine, things like that. Um, and that love or interest has grown over the years as I've learned that more and more of what orthopedic surgeons deal with, much like more and more of what most doctors deal with, are actually all coming down to a couple of root causes that we really could fix with being more well or more healthy. One of these root causes is oxidative stress. And you may have heard this term, you may not have, but basically oxidative stress along with low grade chronic inflammation, these are the true root causes of almost everything you think of as a disease, diabetes, cancer, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, anything related to aging, uh, arthritis, arthritic pain, cartilage de degeneration, tendon degeneration. We're now learning more and more in medicine and science that oxidative stress is the true culprit. And so I spent a lot of time sort of relearning what I learned back in organic chemistry years and years and years ago um, to give myself a better understanding of how what I recommend to treat this really works. And hopefully I've made this clear in this lecture today. If not, uh, we'll have to delve into it deeper and maybe I'll have to write a couple white papers for y'all. But let's get started and talk about oxidative stress in a minute here. That's me. All right. <laughs> this is what we offer at my clinic currently and we keep trying to add different wellness um, or health related features, I guess you will. We can do personal training programs for people, fitness programs. Exercise is integral to reducing oxidative stress, but, but you don't have to be a hero. You don't have to train for an ultra marathon or anything. Basic things like walking and maybe just a little bit of weightlifting a couple times a week. We help people with that. We do aesthetic services because most of skin damage and sagging faces, things like that, again, related to oxidative stress over time. We do infrared spa treatments because that level of heat using a light wave that is invisible to the human eye is very effective in, in helping treat these root causes. Physical therapy, obviously we do surgery. That's our one of our main features that we offer. We love regenerative medicine, anything that increases the body's own healing capacity. Functional fitness, yoga, you name it. We're very interested in helping people just live their best life, feel really good, play with their grandkids, do really good jobs at work and perform for their families. Um, and that's what we do. This is our space, our clinic, and now let's get into it. So basically, if you have pain from arthritis, that's what it feels like, achy bones that hurt when you first get up, stiff joints, like your hips are super stiff when you get out of a car after driving for two hours, that's oxidative stress to your tendons and your ligaments. Brain fog, fatigue, that's oxidative stress in your brain, confusion, um, memory, memory loss, any kind of muscle aches, um, really anything that you think of as age-related aches and pains and problems, you know, you probably say to yourself, and I hear it all the time, oh, you know, once you hit 40, you go downhill. Uh, we actually don't have to because really, if you could control your oxidative stress, none of that nonsense will actually happen. And you can really feel great up until the very end. So what it is. So essentially, it's when the reactive oxygen species, which hopefully we'll talk about later in this lecture, it's when the reactive oxygen species outnumber the number of antioxidants you have in your body. So your body is essentially a chemical plant that produces energy with electricity. I know that's hard to fathom, but we're basically just a bunch of protons, which are positively charged, which are negatively charged, and we use a gradient of that charge to go from high energy to low energy states and produce energy, just like a fuel plant does, just like the engine in your car does, just like burning a fire does. So um, most things in nature all have a common method, and we are an electrical system, and our process of creating electricity and fuel uh, produces a byproduct called reactive oxygen species. And those are use, useful in a little bit in the body for signaling and things like that. But at the end of the day, if you have too many of these reactive oxygen species, they cause damage and I'll hopefully get into that too. Um, how we fight that is the body actually produces antioxidants that chew those up. Um, and then you can take extra antioxidants, which is what I do because I just don't trust that I eat well enough. 
to give my system all the antioxidants it needs. So again, it's from the normal metabolic process of the mitochondria, when the chemical processes that create fuel from the food you eat release these species, reactive oxygen species. Some people say free radicals too. They're slightly different, so we'll just go with reactive oxygen species most of the time because it's a little bit more general. All right. So all of this starts with a process called, are they, hold on, they really changed this order up. Okay, starts with this process called oxidative phosphorylation. What does this mean? That's just the term for how our chemical plant makes energy. We use something called the electron transport chain, the ETC, and then we use an enzyme called ATP synthase. So the electron transport chain gives electrons, negative ions, through a cell membrane and creates a gradient of protons, positively charged ions. The protons fall through ATP synthase in a gradient. So there's one area with super high levels of protons, one side of a membrane with super low levels of protons. I don't know if you could see this. Say this is your cell membrane. You'll have a ton of protons here, no protons here because they're pumped through by way of the electron transport chain. And then those drop through using osmosis, which is anytime you have something really thick and heavy with like sediment or salt will go to the area of empty water, okay? That's how osmotic purification of water uses. That's how Dasani water is made, they use osmosis. So you'll take high levels of protons, drop it through this enzyme and it creates energy. So it converts ADP to ATP, which is our usable form of energy. Think of it like, you get oil out of the ground, right, or crude, that's your food. Crude is broken down and refined into oil. That's the molecules that come out of food, like glucose and lipids and proteins, amino acids. Then you take that and you still have to go to a refining plant, okay, that's your electron transport chain. Then you have to get into a car's combustion engine and that's when you actually move and that's our ATP synthase. So we're just like any other electrical process or energy producing process in the body and the world. So electrons, Go back one more, sorry. So whenever I talk about oxidation and oxidative stress, if you look on the bottom here, superoxide, peroxide, hydroxyl radical and oxide, those are the actual uh, oxidative molecules, okay? Those are the damaging products, reactive oxygen species that your electron transport chain is producing in every cell in your body every single day, all the time. That's what's damaging, that's what needs to be either utilized immediately or neutralized with an antioxidant. So oxidative stress, so we talked about it again. So those free radicals we just talked about, superoxide, peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radical, which is probably the worst one, go in and damage proteins. They damage the lipid membranes of all cells, so that's called lipid peroxidation, and they damage DNA. And that's why we think that a lot of cancer is from oxidative stress. So it'll actually alter the genetic coding of a DNA molecule and give it a mutation. Um, and so this is a great study somebody showed of skin damage over years, and, and they've actually graded it and made it standard. So you can almost predict somebody's age or predict what they'll look like at a certain age. That's why we're able to do these age-changing photographs of people. Um, this shows you what oxidative stress does to the skin cells over time. So starting at grade zero, years and years of bad diet, pollution, time, what have you, and then you get to grade seven. All right, so here's where it all begins. So you eat something, right? So that food will actually be turned into a usable molecule. Remember, you can't run your car off a of crude. So crude's gotta be turned into oil, which is usable, right? Or the sunlight has to be turned into something in a photovoltaic panel that'll allow it to be usable in a solar plant. This, is, this happens with glycolysis, lipolysis, different processes that break down bread into glucose, lipid into different fatty acids and protein into amino acids. So now you've got your glucose, your fructose, your fatty acids and your amino acids. So these are usable products. Well, then these get broken down into a couple different molecules, mostly pyruvate, which then enter what's called the Krebs cycle. And anybody that's taken high school chemistry or college chemistry has heard of this or biology even. The Krebs cycle is what makes the molecules NADH and FADH that then can enter the electron transport chain and that's your refinery, which will then make usable fuel, ATP, so that we can live our lives. So the oxidative process releases the stored energy in the bread you eat, the meat you eat, the vegetables and fruits you eat, okay? There's stored energy in there.
oxidative process takes this through a series of chemical reactions and releases that energy and lets us use that energy to do everything that we do. So this is also called the citric acid cycle. Some people call it that or the Krebs cycle. Krebs was, I believe, a German scientist that first described this. So again, you've got the initial metabolic pathways, okay, giving you the raw materials for the common metabolic pathway. We already talked about this. Bread breaks down a glucose, fruit breaks down a fructose, so on and so forth. And then those enter the common pathway, which is Krebs. And that's because those are broken down into a couple of usable molecules like pyruvate, which then combines with oxaloacetate and form, forms acetyl-CoA. But we're not gonna get too much into that. Pyruvate enters the mitochondrial chains and, you'll, and then the electron transport chain. So from one molecule of glucose, you'll effectively get, and this is debatable, some people say 26, some say 32. I've read a couple places even higher. Somewhere between 20 and 30 to 32 will say molecules of ATP. So massively efficient. So this is your oxidative phosphorylation. And meanwhile, you're creating free radicals. So we've got to figure out how to neutralize that. And we're going to talk about it. So glucose is broken down to acetate, joins citrate in the Krebs cycle. Each molecule of acetate will produce two carbon molecules through this circle of chemical reactions. So at the end of the day, the Krebs cycle makes two molecules of carbon dioxide, carbon C, O2 is oxygen, and there's two of them, so carbon dioxide. And it passes the electrons. It's derived from these full, full, few, blah, food molecules, so it pulls the energy out in the form of electrons, and then passes that to the electron transport chain. So think of the Krebs cycle as like you've refined your crude into oil. So now you've got light crude and heavy crude, and now, now we can move on to the refining process. And here we are. So the bottom right picture is your mitochondria, and if you've watched other lectures I've given, the mitochondria is the true source of all things good and bad in the body. It is the powerhouse and the engine of all your cells. So your cell makes energy in the mitochondria just like your car makes energy in the engine, right? So it does this by way of the electron transport chain which sits in the membrane, okay? And then again, it's the only purpose of this electron transport chain is to push protons onto one side of the membrane so that they then wanna naturally fall to the other side to even it out. And that's how you create the energy. So you think of it like a turbine. ATPase is like a turbine. Like wind pushes the winds, uh, the blades of an air turbine or the turbine in a jet engine. So that's how you're getting your motion and your energy. And so the Krebs cycle places two electrons on NAD, which is nicotinamide, adenine, di dinucleotide. And you may have seen ads for supplements of NAD and all that. And this is a whole point of it. NAD is really just... a it's a way to transfer electrons into the electron transport chain so ultimately they can end up on oxygen and form water. Water is a waste product in our body, that's why we urinate. So the whole purpose of this is really just to move electrons around so that we could get a proton gradient to go through our pump to make ATP. So what we'll do in this, in this system is we'll actually reduce NAD to NADH and we reduce FAD to FADH. All that means is we're putting some electrons on it so that it can then pass electrons to the electron transport chain. So hopefully this has made sense. So you eat bread, it becomes glucose. The glucose gets broken down, put into the citrate cycle or the Krebs cycle, it spins around a series of chem chemical reactions and ultimately all that happens there is the energy from the glucose is put onto these molecules, NAD, FAD, and then also GDP, which then go to the electron transport chain and provide electrons to feed the refinery. So again, this just reviews that. So the Krebs cycle is central in the mitochondria. You've got the inner membrane, you've got the matrix. So the Krebs cycle sits in the matrix, spitting out these NADH molecules, FADH. Those go to the electron transport chain, which is in the membrane, makes a proton gradient, okay? So you're then all of a sudden, you got one side of this membrane that's super high in protons, positive charge. One side of the membrane that's super low in protons, negative charge. And then there's only one way to get through, and that's through ATPase, and that's how we make energy. So oxidative reduction, this is a busy slide. I think we sort of already talked about this more or less. Just know that each one of these turns of the Krebs cycle will release two molecules of carbon dioxide. That's why we breathe out that waste product, right? And then at the end of the day, you're gonna make water. So this is why we need oxygen to do this whole process, and I'll explain why. That's why we have to breathe it in. So we need oxygen to live and make energy, but the problem with oxygen is it will then make oxidative stress with these 
oxidized or superoxides and peroxides, the reactive oxygen species that are the byproducts. So this is much like anything in life, right? Too much of something's too good, or I'm sorry, too much of something is bad, too little of something is bad. We need oxygen, but it has its own problems. So then we create ways to combat that. So we talk about, this is just showing you the Krebs cycle and how complicated it is. So you start at the top with acetyl-CoA, you have these molecules, they effectively take the energy from food, drop it into three molecules of NADH, some FADH, GTP, and then those enter the electron transport chain. That's really all you need to know here. Each glucose molecule, again, goes to somewhere 20 to 30 ATPs, it's debatable. And this is where the magic happens. So this is your inner mitochondrial membrane. So remember we saw the mitochondria, it was like an oval with a bunch of squiggly lines in it. Well, that's these membranes. They're, it's like racked with it. So think of it like a server building racked with computers. And each of these is gonna transfer electrons so that you can make energy through ATPase. And that's a, a process called chemoosmosis or chemiosmosis, I should say. So again, one side is negatively charged, one side is positively charged. We can only achieve that gradient if you have a way to move the electrons through. And you do that with these complexes, one, two, three, and four. Each of these has what are called redox centers, and they will actually take the electron paired with the proton, right? Because negative likes to pair with positive. They'll take the electron, so this becomes reduced nicotine, nicotinamide adenine di dinucleotide, it's such a mouthful and it loses an electron to the system, it goes back to NAD. Then guess what? NAD goes back to the Krebs cycle and gets fed a couple more electrons and keeps coming back. So this is like a, this keeps going on and on and on. So the electrons pass through here, okay? And then that gives this the energy to pump protons through. And I'm simplifying this, but that's in it in a nutshell. Any excess electrons are tagged on to coenzyme Q. This is why CoQ10 is so important, or ubiquinone, some people call it. CoQ10 then brings it to two. Two is effectively just a depot for electrons. It doesn't really supercharge and pass protons. Moves on again through CoQ to three. This gets supercharged, pumps protons through, and four pumps protons through. And then four is where you take whatever's left of the electrons. They go to oxygen, right? You add a couple electrons, they pick up a couple protons to match, and guess what you end up with? Water. So oxygen is the final electron acceptor of this entire system. That's why we need oxygen. Water is the waste product of this final system, okay? And carbon dioxide is a waste product of the Krebs cycle. So this is how it all works, and it's in this inner mitochondrial membrane. The, the mitochondria is super, super important, and the health of your mitochondria is super, super important. This is a great picture I found on, um, I'll tell you, it's a free online course from Harvard on cell biology. I think it was titled Mitochondria. I love these, these sort of artistic renderings of your cell membrane. This is supposed to show you ATPase. This actually spins in the animation and that's how it works in the body. So as the protons drop through, it spins literally like a turbine. And it, what it does is it adds a phosphate group with energy to a, DP, which is adenosine diphosphate, and makes it adenosine triphosphate, which is the form of energy that our cells like to use. So ATP gives us most of our energy. The proton flow from one side of the membrane rotates the turbine and adds that phosphate group to create the energy. And the rest of the mitochondrial membrane literally just exists to maintain that gradient. Okay, and it does some other things. I mean, there's some proteins that are made in enzymes and whatnot, but effectively the mitochondria exists to give us energy. And without it, we can't do anything else. So again, why do we breathe oxygen? Because that is how this whole thing works. It is the final electron acceptor. So it'll take these electrons, right, and create the water, and this is how the chain can start again. If this was chock full of electrons and it didn't have a way to get rid of them and create this gradient, it would just stop, it would just halt. It would be like if you plugged up your exhaust in your car, it would just blow up. So you have to have oxygen as the final electron acceptor. And there's some molecular reasons why O2 likes electrons and doesn't like electrons, but effectively at the end of the day, H2O is made, which is two positive, right, protons, plus the molecule of oxygen. So again, your electrons, which are the negatively charged things that we use for energy, because we're really just electrical plants, the electrons move from complex one to complex four by way of coenzyme Q and redox centers, and effectively transfer the energy 
from what started as bread or what started as a piece of steak or a vegetable, right? And it takes the energy from that, pushes it through these membranes, creates the proton gradient, and then you get energy. Well, unfortunately, the byproducts of this is gonna be some reactive oxygen species, which we already named. So this shows you the complexes, one, two, three, four, again, from that Harvard site. And it, it's just a beautiful system, and it's constantly working. These things are all packed in next to each other, and it's just very fluid, assuming that you're giving it the right materials, correct, and you're not overwhelming it with reactive oxygen species. Because what will happen is you see that beautiful membrane. Well, if you have too many reactive oxygen species, they're going to go in and destroy that membrane. Well, you could imagine if there's a bunch of holes in that membrane, none of this is going to work, right? You can't create a proton gradient if the membrane's destroyed. That's why it's so important to control oxidative stress, one of the reasons. So what are other sources of free radicals besides that process, which is, of course, the primary source of free radicals, right, is our own electrical plants? Well, you can also get it from ionizing radiation. There's cosmic radiation, right? This is why space travel tends to be a little bit tricky. We're surrounded by radiation all the time. If you fly from New York to California, you are exposing yourself to a significant level of radiation just on that flight because you're closer to space, right? Gamma rays, x-rays, all of that is ionizing radiation, and that in and of itself will create radical oxygen species that damage tissue. If you see the banana skin there, that is a sign of oxidative stress, okay? Just like wrinkles are a sign of oxidative stress. UV rays, okay? We always hear about this, wear your sunscreen, wear your sunscreen. Well, now, of course, you got to be careful of which sunscreen you wear because more and more information is coming out about the ingredients they use there. So be careful because some of those can cause oxidative stress. So this is why UV rays are bad. Pollution, air pollution, water pollution, noise pollution, any, any kind of pollution you can think of causes oxidative stress because it ultimately creates reactive oxygen species at the cellular level. Smoking is by far one of the worst ways that you could destroy yourself because it is just, you're basically just asking to bathe yourself in oxidative stress. And then other toxins like pesticides, heavy metals, different things they put in your food supply, water supply. Endogenous or inner sources of, of these reactive oxygen species is, again, the electron transport chain, which is a primary source of this, but also innate immunity. So anytime you're exposed to a virus or a pathogen or you have an injury, your natural killer cells, your neutrophils, your macrophages come in and engulf these pathogens, these invaders, and destroy them. Well, how do they destroy them? They basically release a bag of um, peroxide or hydroxyl radical, they basically have an oxidative burst and it, think of it like throwing acid on these creatures to destroy them. Well, they're storing them in this nice little bag right before they release it, but the electron transport chain, these things are all free floating everywhere and without antioxidants, you're just damaging yourself repeatedly in multiple places over time, as opposed to the innate immunity system, which is a little bit more targeted to say a virus or say a bacteria. Why do I care about this? Why would you care about this? This is all very esoteric, right? It sounds like a bunch of gobbledygook. Well, unfortunately, look at this. Free radical oxidative stress, okay? What we talked about before, the byproducts of the mitochondrial electron transport chain. Look at this list of diseases that we are now pretty sure all start and end with oxidative stress. Cardiovascular disease, macular degeneration, retinal degeneration, diabetes, chronic fatigue, um, chronic inflammation, autoimmune disorders, MS, a lot of forms of cancer, Alzheimer, Parkinson's, autism, migraine, stroke, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, which I see obviously all day long every day as an orthopedic surgeon. Anything that you think of that is a quote unquote aging issue, there's really an oxidative stress issue. So if you could control your oxidative stress and your chronic inflammation, what used to be called aging doesn't really need to happen for you. That's what I'm hoping for myself. I'm hoping to try to figure out the best ways to control this. So here's a great image uh, showing an age advanced, well, not really an age advanced, but technically it would be age advanced, but this is a mother and a daughter showing sort of the progression of what oxidative stress will do to the face in terms of volume loss of fat, changes in bone architecture and changes of skin structure and collagen. Collagen is just a connective tissue. You can keep your collagen nice, young and healthy as long as you can control inflammation, exogenous sources of free radicals like UV, and endogenous sources of free radicals like your mitochondrial electron transport chain. And you can control that with diet, sleep, 
exercise and taking a good amount of antioxidants, in my opinion. So again, all right, so why would humans be like this? This doesn't make sense. Why would we have a system that attacks ourselves? Well, it is what it is when you're making electricity, but we have developed a way to process the reactive oxygen species. We make our own antioxidants. One of them is superoxide dismutase. So dismutases take two molecules, reduce one, and oxidize the other, okay? So a gain of electron is a reduction, loss of electron is oxidation. So if you have two reactive oxygen species of superoxide, which is oxygen plus an extra electron, okay, so it's got three electrons now instead of two, and that's a highly reactive molecule. And what I mean by reactive is if you've got oxygen, which normally has two electrons spinning against each other and you add a third, that third electron does not wanna be there and it wants to glom on somewhere and it'll attack a protein in your cell, it'll attack the lipid bimembrane or worse, it'll attack your DNA. So you've got this highly reactive superoxide molecule, okay? One of the things we do is we as it with superoxide dismutase. Things in your body to make the superoxide dismutase. So there's two of them. There's one on the mitochondrial side, one on the cytoplasmic side. One uses copper and zinc to be formed, one uses manganese, and I'm simplifying this obviously. But you can see how now we're starting to talk about micronutrients, right? What we eat, why it's important, why does it matter? It's not just voodoo, it's not just gobbledygook, but the diet that you put into your system is so important because of this. Without the right micronutrients, you cannot make antioxidants and you will effectively destroy yourself over time. Superoxide dismutase then converts superoxide to peroxide. Well, we all know peroxide's not good for cells, right? So what happens here? Well, this gets then reduced or neutralized by a different antioxidant. And then we've got glutathione peroxidase, okay? You've probably heard me talking about glutathione before. That's one of our most powerful, innate antioxidants that we produce. Basically, <clears throat> glutathione is uh, the reduced form. And then you've got glutathione disulfide. You can see GSSG, so two sulfide units with a, di with a sulfide bridge. And then that uses selenium. This is why you hear about selenium sometimes. And the oxidized form is effectively the antioxidant action. So glutathione will take that unstable electron or two electrons, right, spinning around on these free radical species or reactive oxygen species. It'll pull it off, take it into itself, or add an electron to stabilize that, right, and basically neutralize it. So the whole thing about antioxidants is anytime there's an odd number of electrons, it's a reactive thing and you basically wanna pair it up with another electron and make it an even number, okay? And that's how antioxidants work. Glutathione is an awesome one that we make, it's super powerful. And one of uh, the supplements I often recommend and that we have on Well Theory is ALA, which actually provides one of the cysteine molecules needed for your body to make more glutathione. So this is why I keep talking about these antioxidants and these building blocks. Catalase is another one. It takes two molecules of H2O2 and it reduces it to two waters, H2O and O2, oxygen. So it's all just chemistry, right? Basic chemistry. But at the end of the day, it's massively important and it's why we had that slide before with all those diseases. So what happens when you end up with hyperreactive hydroxyl molecules? So hydroxyl is the worst, okay? Um, this one uses what are called small molecule antioxidants. So now we're not using enzymes. So what I talked about before were enzymes that created reactions to make a redox pair, a reduction oxidation, where the excess electron on the reactive species was neutralized, right? The small molecules work slightly differently. It's not really a chemical reaction more than it's like a transfer of electrons from the reactive species to the small molecule, okay? And so you may ask yourself, well, if you're moving the reactive oxygen species to vitamin C or vitamin E, why is that not now its own reactive oxygen species? Well, it's complicated chemistry, but basically those molecules are so stable that they never give up that extra electron. Therefore, they're not gonna go attack membranes. They're not gonna attack proteins. They're not gonna attack DNA. But hydroxyl radical will, so you've got to have enough vitamin E in your system or tocopherol, vitamin C or ascorbic acid. Okay, these are your small molecule antioxidants. This is why um, 
maybe you've heard of something called the cytokine storm, which is when you have such a massive reaction to a virus that your body effectively starts to attack itself. Well, you can really kind of tamp down a cytokine storm in a self-attacking mode if you have enough vitamin C in your system. Why? Because it's a small molecule antioxidant, and it's going to keep that burst of acid that we talked about with the neutrophils and the macrophage, it's going to keep that from attacking us because it's going to neutralize it. So this is why vitamins and supplements and a proper diet are so, so important. Also avoiding exogenous sources like radiation and smoking, obviously. So some are lipophilic. They like to exist in the membrane, right, to protect the membrane itself. And some are hydrophilic, and they like to exist on either side of the membrane more in the watery environment, okay? So vitamin C is in the cytosol, and it's just kind of like hanging out, ready to protect. And then vitamin E, tocopherol, is in the membrane, as is beta carotene. So this is why you should be eating sweet, sweet potatoes, carrots, those kind of foods, pigmented vegetables, because they have beta carotene. They've got vitamin E. And then the citric fruits, um, like oranges, lemons, and then tomatoes, things like that, have vitamin C. And then also, I take extra. Vitamin E is a little bit tricky. I don't really recommend supplementing with that. I think you can probably get enough from your diet. But C is water soluble. And a lot of times you'll just urinate what you don't need. So I take extra. All right. And here we're talking about it. So you see the vitamin E is sort of the, it looks like a, a iPod earbud actually hanging out in the membrane in line with the lipoproteins there. The dots are supposed to be representing your reactive oxygen species. So your hydroxyl radical. So before that hydroxyl radical can destroy the fatty membrane and create holes in the membrane, which again, matter because now all of a sudden you got a leaky membrane so you can't have that proton gradient, the vitamin E will attach to it and neutralize it. So this is the beauty of our system and our body. We've got a defense system built in, policing the whole area, making sure these hydroxyl radicals aren't running around killing things. Um, and then we use a hydroxyl radical when we need it, like if we're fighting off a virus. All right, so again, back to the basics for probably what's important. What causes oxidative stress? Well, we talked about our energy production system, which unfortunately we need. So no one here should try to stop making energy. That's not gonna happen. So you're gonna have some of these reactive oxygen species as a side product, so you just have to achieve a way to neutralize them, okay? But things you can modify and risk factors you can control is sleep. Sleep is hugely important. A lot of this work of detoxing, cleaning up, making sure we get rid of all the bad stuff, making sure the membrane's solid with no holes in it, repairing proteins, repairing DNA, a lot of that happens at night, particularly for the brain. So you really need about seven to eight hours of sleep. Now, no human being is exactly like every other, and of course there's some exceptions to this rule, but in general, seven to eight hours of good sleep every night is hugely important for these processes. Diet. So again, I talked about sweet potato, carrots, tomatoes, citrus. So notice I didn't mention steak and I didn't mention bacon. You don't wanna be eating too much of that, okay? You're not getting any antioxidants from those. But a heavy vegetable and fruit and whole grains, okay? Bread's not bad unless it's processed bread. Whole, anything that grows up as a plant is probably okay for you, you know, with the exception of poisonous things, as long as it's not ultra processed. So the Mediterranean diet, which is my favorite, we recommends about eight to nine servings of vegetables and fruits a day. That's a lot. I can't eat that many. I'm too busy. Plus, I forget to, and it takes a lot of work. And, you know, it's hard to find that many without a bunch of pesticides on it. Um, so I'll supplement with a bunch of phytochemicals, too, which we'll talk about. But you've got to give the micronutrients to make the antioxidants in your body and to allow your system to repair itself so that what? So that this can work, so you can make energy, okay? And then pollutants, try to avoid pollution. I, I live in South Louisiana around a bunch of chemical plants. Very hard to avoid pollution here. Um, I drink, I have a special water filter system and I try to only eat organic fruits and vegetables, try to avoid any meat that's not cage-free, free-run, grass-fed. There's certain things you can do, because uh, at the end of the day, it's way more expensive to have oxidative stress than to prevent it. Okay, and then remember the exogenous sources, which we sort of just talked about. Obviously, don't smoke. Here's one I do want to talk about, right? What do you see there? That is everybody's grocery store on the planet Earth at this point, okay? Because our methods of food processing and food industry have pretty much permeated and taken over everywhere. These are what we call ultra-processed foods, okay? 
and this may be a new concept to some of you guys out there, you've heard of the food pyramid and you've heard of the food groups. Well, at the end of the day, if you can avoid ultra processed or even highly processed foods, then you're going to be saving yourself a lot of those outside sources of free radicals, okay? Because they're coming from these foods. Smoking meats creates uh, um, oxidized species, okay? So you're basically just adding them when you eat it. Processed meats like hams and bacons and things. High fructose corn syrup, which remember the FDA was wholeheartedly behind. High fructose corn syrup massively increases inflammation and oxidative stress. Hydrogenated oils, which is really just code for trans fats, also really, really bad for you. And then remember, a lot of these foods are processed with chemicals like hexane, bleach, butane. I mean, name it, like stuff that you think of comes out of a spray can. They're using to make food that you're putting in your, in your body and worse, your kids' bodies. So if you can avoid factory-made foods that would not exist in nature but for that factory, um, I think you'll be doing yourself a favor. Now, obviously, this is gonna be hard to do. So I suggest small steps like, if you find that you eat a lot of Cheetos, maybe just cut that down to once a week, and then ideally once a month, and then ideally never. Um, there's really no place in your diet for ultra processed foods. However, being in America, I know it's almost impossible not to eat these things. I still eat some of these things. So you gotta think about how do I combat the damage these factory foods are doing to my body? And that's where the antioxidants and the anti-inflammatories that you should be taking come into play. Okay, so how does food do this? So I showed you two pictures here. Young, healthy person eating fruits and vegetables, not so healthy, aged person, right? Eating processed meats, factory-made foods with a lot of additives and pesticides, ultra-processed, toxins. Basically just eating a bunch of poison versus somebody that's eating what would actually be considered food. Okay, so the guy in the top right, of course he's gonna age. He's filling himself full of hydrogenated oils, alcohols, pesticides, chemicals, and things that have actually, the factory actually goes in and changes the molecular structure of your food before they put it in a package. You get stiff and unhealthy membranes with the holes in it that don't work right, okay? You get no micronutrients, so you can't make the enzymes you need, and you don't have the small molecule antioxidants to chew up the oxidative stress, and they're highly inflammatory. So you, of course you're gonna age, and of course you're gonna have problems. You gotta give your system the right input to get the right output, just like any other system. And so this shows you the two ways of being. Okay, the top is what I espouse, sort of the Mediterranean lifestyle, the Mediterranean diet. Whole foods as much as you can, fresh foods as much as you can, organic, avoiding pesticides and toxins. A lot of people, even some of my family members laugh, like, ugh, I don't want any organic food in my house. That's crazy, you're crazy, you're just a tree hugger. Well, I'm not, I just don't want a bunch of toxins creating hydroxyl radicals that are ultimately gonna kill me. I wanna stay like the lady on top and I wanna avoid being like the lady on the bottom. So all those highly processed foods down there, I try to avoid those now. I'm not saying it's easy. Who doesn't love a donut? Who doesn't love French fries? But the, remember, those are engineered so you do like them. And once you start to think of it that way, you really just don't wanna be manipulated. So stick with what was put on the planet and is natural. And there, you can process it, you can cook it, put some spices and whatnot, add some good oils like extra virgin olive oil. I'm not saying you only have to eat fresh vegetables, but definitely avoid anything that would only exist because there's factories. So again, mitigation of oxidative stress, which now you understand how oxidative stress happens and how energy production happens. Relieve your stress, mental stress, messes this whole system up too, because it alters how the enzymes are made, different hormones come around and do different things and change the processes. So meditating, relaxing, doing something nice for yourself once in a while, getting in a quiet room, whatever you can do to relieve your stress is hugely important. Diet and sleep we already talked about. And then <clears throat> what I like to do and why I have a whole line of these things now for my patients and my family and friends is to add to what I'm able to eat in my daily basis, which you know, I mean, I admit I don't eat a perfect diet. I wish I did, but I take a lot of antioxidants and natural anti-inflammatories to make up for that. Tart cherry extract, alpha lipoic acid, which we talked about, which helps you make your own glutathione, which again is an enzyme that helps protect the lipid membrane, right? And then CBD, 
actually helps. That's from the non-psychoactive component of the marijuana plant, but actually THC is highly antioxidant as well. CBD is a ready acceptor of electrons. So you put CBD next to a hydroxyl radical, it's going to suck off that reactive uh, electron and protect you. That's why CBD is so good for the immune system and the overall system of your body. Okay, tart cherry also massively good for you. And I could go on and on and on, beta carotene, whatnot, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, because they give you a nice smooth lipid membrane that works a little bit better. Um, and then let's, you can go on, let's talk about tart cherry specifically. So I found this great article where they actually did a chemical reaction that tests the antioxidant capacity of different types of cherries and tart cherries. And this just shows you the x-axis is the uh, level of antioxidant capacity. The y-axis is just different types of cherry. Like one is a Balaton dried cherry. One is a Montmorency concentrate. One's frozen. One's a powder. It turns out freezing doesn't hurt tart cherry's antioxidant capacity. It actually helps it. And then the powders work really, really well too. So like our tart cherry is 1,500 milligrams of the powder with a good amount of antioxidant capacity. And so this is actual science that actually works. And how does it work? Because plants have created their own way to combat oxidative stress because they get it from the sun, from pollution, from different um, damaging substances from predators and whatnot. And so we can use those phytochemicals, those protective elements, and our body can harness that and use it as well. So in tart cherry, the cyanidin-3 glucoside is the strongest antioxidant molecule. And they've actually looked at the an ancothiacin or anthocyanin, I should say, content by weight. So you get anywhere from between 173 to 1,741 grams per gram of dry weight of antioxidant power when you take these phytochemicals. Most doses in the literature average, similar to what you would get if you ate 100 cherries a day. That's a lot of sugar, so I don't usually recommend that, but you can certainly get it that way, and some people prefer that. I don't want that much sugar, so I just take the extract. You get a high level of phenolics, again, a phytochemical that fights oxidative stress and inflammation, and the anthocyanins. And then <clears throat> what we've learned is that tart, just, and this is just speak, speaking specifically for tart cherry, all of these phytochemicals and plant-based antioxidants work different ways to combat different ones of those oxidative species. Remember, I showed you a list about four or five. And so they all act in different ways in different parts of the chain to help us neutralize antioxidants. That's why you should not probably be taking just a single antioxidant. You should take more than one uh, to help yourself along the whole way of that electron transport chain. And again, a UV ray is gonna do something different than gamma radiation. So you gotta, gotta have all the pieces in there to fight it back. So tart cherry will inhibit the lipid peroxidation up to 30% almost by just acting as a small molecule neutralizer. I mean, it's pretty powerful and amazing. The antioxidant capacity of tart cherry is similar to these commercially available substances. You probably never heard of these, BHT, TBHQ. BHT is butylated hydroxytoluene. This is something that your food industry is putting into foods to preserve them so they last on the shelves. What are they preserving the foods against? Oxidative stress. So BHT pulls off free radicals that are formed over time as food sits on a shelf and lets it last longer. So like, let's say you buy two loaves of bread. You buy one that was fresh made at a bakery and then you buy one that's packaged up and shipped to you, right? Well, one, that one, the packaged one is gonna sit without molding for like weeks. And it's because they're adding all these chemicals. You actually want the bread that starts to mold within a day or two, because that means it doesn't have all these added chemicals to pull off the free radicals, right? So tar now, now food industry is starting to look at natural substances to add to food as antioxidant, tart cherry extract being one of them. So I take this every day. And micronutrients matter. Remember I told you that? With the superoxide dismutase and the glutathione, you've gotta have the building blocks. You gotta have the copper, the zinc, the manganese. You've gotta have um, the cysteine molecules. You've gotta have the energy to do all this formation. And so the micronutrients in the sweet and tart cherry is listed here, vitamin C, niacin, pentothenic acid, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin K, beta carotene, lutein, all of these are acting in a protective manner for you. They're like workhorses to defend you from badness. And so you can support your endogenous, your self-made antioxidants by adding exogenous or external forms of antioxidants. 
think of this. In the 1970s, and of course, we don't track this over time, but since they've started tracking this, the 1970s, Americans who in the 70s were probably not considered the healthiest of people, we still ate 180, 215 milligrams daily of anthocyanins, the plant phytochemical that's protective. Guess what we eat now? 12.5. I mean, that's pathetic. In other cultures, they're in the thousands, right? So that's why it's important to eat foods heavy in micronutrients. Safe, healthy, natural foods that aren't made in a factory that grow from a plant. Plant-based diet is by far the best. If you're gonna eat meat, eat it sparingly and make sure it's sourced very, very well. And of course, always discuss any supplementation with your doctor. I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do. I'm just telling you what I've learned over the years and what I try to do. So again, talking about tart cherry, which is, I take it when I have a headache now or if I have any muscle soreness. I haven't taken ibuprofen or any synthetic anti-inflammatories in like probably two years now, because this works great for me. Uh, packed with or anthocyanins and packed with phenolics. Like I said, I just gave you that list of micronutrients. You can reduce oxidative stress everywhere. Cartilage, brain, muscle, bone. That's why these things work well, but I don't just take tart cherry. I also eat as many fruits and vegetables as I can. An apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? I try to eat two, because I don't like going to the doctor. And then I take ALA. Why? Because I want to upregulate my glutathione. I don't want to protect my brain. All of these things add up over time. Omega-3s, resveratrol, you name it. And I, I think you should start thinking this way and at least go start eating mini carrots or something, organic if you can. Uh, it's really, really important to get the micronutrients to fight the oxidative stress so that your power plant can work at its most effective manner without inundating you with the waste byproducts, okay? You don't want all those hydroxyl radicals rolling around. All right, I hope there's questions. I was waiting for an oxidative force correlation question. My supplements are available either in my clinic or uh, thewelltheory.com. And I would, I would uh, say CBD is really good. CBD you take at night because it, it also helps you sleep. Tart cherry you take at night because it naturally also has melatonin, which is another phytochemical that's an antioxidant. But melatonin also obviously helps you sleep. And ALA I take in the morning. All right. Well, good. I hope, I hope it was... Uh, understandable. It's very complicated. The human body is an amazing, amazing, amazing thing. And if you really think about it, really just sort of a oozy, wet power plant walking around, somehow able to think and do things that are pretty cool. I find it fascinating. Does anybody have any questions? Otherwise, no students out there calling me out on anything? some people telling me that they are on some of these, which is great, but I also want you to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. Like I said, I mean, even start with just an apple a day. It'll change your life. Pack full of quercetin. Yeah, and we're actually about to come out with a coenzyme Q and a quercetin. We have a quercetin now with D and C to help with the immune system. Remember I told you about that oxidative burst for your innate immunity? D3 is integral to all of the function of the immune system, as is CBD. These things all play in together. <clears throat> you, don't, you don't have to fall victim to all of these problems in life. We really do have some tools to fight it. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, James, sorry. My technical, my ears aren't working today, I guess. Uh, said lots of good information, thank you. I find this stuff very interesting and um, probably have to talk about it a couple more times to really make it drive it home, but, but I think if we can understand why oxidative stress happens and it's not just a buzzword, I think you'll start to understand why micronutrients and diet matter. And then maybe at some point we'll talk about how exercise helps combat this too and different drugs like metformin, which actually change the energy state of your mitochondria. There's a lot of fascinating work being done out there on improving the mitochondrial function and effectively fighting off cancer, fighting off Parkinson's, fighting off Alzheimer, all these problems that we associate with aging and uh, degeneration. Uh, this question was, if you have an x-ray, is there anything that you should take afterwards to help with the free radicals and how much? So that's an interesting question. When Madame Curie first invented the x-ray, sure, you, you would have been really hit with some hard ionizing radiation. Today, the technology has gotten so good 
that it's barely more radiation than like eating a banana probably. So as long as, so like in the, in the OR, I'm surrounded by x-ray all the time. I wear lead cause I'm right up on it. But if I'm not wearing lead, as long as I'm six feet away from that source, I'm fine. But that, that machine is way more powerful than the machines used to take x-rays. So I don't think you need to worry about that so much. The, the technology has gotten really, really good um, in using the least amount of radiation possible. But you should probably be taking antioxidants every day anyway for general wellness, and then you don't have to worry about it, eating fruits and vegetables, things like that. But that was a great question. Oh, what you should take. So again, there's a, a whole bunch of different free radical sources. Um, most of them are from our system of power plant. But again, the exogenous, like we just talked about radiation being one, smoking and pollution. I take different antioxidants, some lipophilic that like to be in the lipid membrane and some that like to be in the, in the cytosol or the water. So like vitamin C, CBD, tart cherry, ALA, which is alpha lipoic acid, resveratrol, which is great for brain health, omega-3 fatty acids, which reduce inflammation, which in turn reduce ox oxidative stress, um, quercetin, gosh, beta carotene, limonene. I mean, all of these things matter, but my, my daily routine is the multi, which has zinc, C, D3, magnesium, and then either CBD or PEA, palmitoid ethanolamide, which is another way to reduce inflammation, tart cherry, avolipoic acid, um, quercetin, <clears throat> turmeric is awesome, and ginger too because of um, gingerol and turmeric has curcuminoids, also very antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. And then um, resveratrol, N-acetylcysteine, I, I just take a whole bunch, but then I also try to eat an apple every day, like I said, I try to eat carrots, try to eat tomatoes, whatever I can get my hands on that is quick and easy because I just don't have time to sit down and make nine servings of vegetables every day. It's not happening for me. Um, hopefully that helps. You can go on our, the website, thewealthier.com has a lot of information about this. And I've been working on a guidebook for people. Hopefully I'll have that soon, within a few months, I'm hoping. Veronica asked, is a cherry concentrate the same? Yeah, you could take a cherry concentrate. It just depends on how you want to get this. I find the extract, which is a, you know, they extract it from a whole bunch of cherries, dry it out and make it a powder. I just find that a more efficient and less sugary way to get what I want out of the fruit, okay? Um, you could take a concentrate, I guess just make sure it doesn't have a lot of sugar in it is all I would say. Um, Lauren asked if wine has antioxidants. This is an awesome question and this is gonna be in my guidebook. Yes, some do. So in particular, red wines have a high level of what's called resveratrol and that is found in the pigment of grapes. So this is why Chardonnays have a little bit less resveratrol because to make a Chardonnay wine, you have to remove the grape skin before you go through, through the fermenting process. Red wine, you leave the grape skin on, thus it's pigmented. Well, a, a lot of the goodness of fruits and vegetables is in the skin. So like try to get your kids to eat the skins of apples, the skins of their potatoes, okay? Otherwise they're wasting their time. Most of it's in the skin okay, or at least that interface between the skin and the fiber. So red wine has a real good amount of resveratrol, which is actually helpful to growing new brain cells. Now, I'm not saying go out and drink a bottle of red wine, but the Mediterranean lifestyle would say that one to two glasses a day would be beneficial. There's a lot of controversy when it comes to alcohol. There's a ton of papers. They seem to change their mind every year. Um, but in general, a little bit is okay, and if not helpful, and resveratrol is the reason why. The question was, do you have a supplement with resveratrol? Yeah, if you don't want to be drinking red wine all the time, which I totally understand, because first of all, it adds a lot of calories, which who needs that? Um, I put 500 milligrams of resveratrol in our nervous system multi because it is so good for the brain and, and such a good detoxing phytochemical. Um, and it's a lot, it's, some people call it the longevity vitamin, right? Resveratrol is actually thought to prolong life and add to your health span. So I take it every day for those reasons. Um, I don't do well with red wine. I get a little bit of a like allergic kind of reaction. So um, I take my resveratrol exogenously. But if you want to do it naturally, you got to eat a bunch of grapes, peanuts, or Japanese knotweed, which I don't think is too tasty, but maybe it is. So how can you test yourself to see what level your antioxidants are? <clears throat> there are a lot of methods they use in the lab that I don't think are translated to clinical medicine yet. 
I believe there are some urine tests you can do to check for total antioxidant capacity, looking at certain metabolites. The problem with any of this is coverage. So insurance companies are not interested in you being well and you having lifelong health because they assume they're not going to be taking care of you your whole life. Um, so any of these like esoteric preventative measures are often not covered. So like, let's say you wanted to check your inflammation, you wanna check your IL-6, your TNF-alpha, and other different uh, parameters. Uh, a lot of times it's not covered unless you come up with some fabulous reason that is of course valid and true that the insurance company will cover it for. So checking your antioxidant capacity is difficult because right now they're probably gonna call it experimental. Is there a multi that contains all this? There's no single supplement that contains everything. First of all, the capsule would be as big as a football, and so that would be difficult. And second of all, again, remember some are lipophilic, which means they like oils, and some aren't. And so powder doesn't mix with oil in a lot of cases, and water extraction doesn't work with ethanol extraction. So no, there's no single supplement that's going to give you everything you need. Um, if you're a vegan and you eat a really awesome vegetarian vegan diet, you're probably getting close to what you need. I, I don't, so I take a whole bunch of different supplements. And yeah, and then you gotta add different minerals and vitamins like B12 and copper and zinc. So no, there's no one single source, sorry, I wish. Oh, um, my technical guru has put in the chat some links to uh, you know how to read about our supplements, which of course there's a million places to get these things, but all the ones I've done, I created myself and designed, product developed, and then we have an awesome factory that tests them for all heavy metals. We don't have anything bad in it. Any more questions, or are we ready to enjoy our Saturday? All right, signing off. Y'all have a great day. Hopefully this kind of opened your eyes to why all of this really does matter, and we're not just making this up. All right, take care.